The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome to the Women in Depth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Join me as we explore the inner lives of women, their struggles, fears, hopes, and dreams. We'll go beneath the surface and take a deeper look at what is hidden, unknown, uncertain, and uncomfortable. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I am really excited about our conversation and our topic because we're going to be delving a little bit more deeply into childhood emotional neglect, or CEN, and specifically how it shows up in the lives of professionals. Dr. Janice Webb is the psychologist who actually identified, named, and has done a ton of research on childhood emotional neglect. And she was on the podcast in episode 11, talking about childhood emotional neglect, the invisible experience. And then again, in episode 62, after childhood emotional neglect, healing your relationships with your partner, children, and parents. And so today we are going to, again, look at childhood emotional neglect, but we're going to be looking at it in the lives of professionals. And my guest today, who's going to be our guide in this area, is Dr. Erica Martinez. She is the founder and owner of Envision Wellness in Miami, Florida. She's a Florida licensed psychologist and certified educator, and she specializes in combining her expertise in assessment, trauma, and shame resilience to address a variety of mental health conditions experienced by young professionals and entrepreneurs, such as anxiety, stress, burnout, limiting beliefs, people-pleasing, self-worth, heartbreak, and toxic relationships or codependency. Dr. Martinez has a passion for helping others cultivate self-awareness and confidence so they can lead and achieve happy and meaningful lives that make the world a better place. Hi, Dr. Martinez, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lourdes. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really glad that we're going to be able to talk about this because I think that uh, childhood emotional neglect and its impact really does show up very strongly in our work lives and the lives of young professionals. Yes, it really does. And it's not unusual for them to, to come into therapy with presenting complaints that like anxiety and depression. And so during the course of treatment, as I get to know them better. It really becomes apparent that this, the symptoms that that they're presenting with, really comes from what they didn't get in childhood. So, it's a very pervasive cluster of symptoms, I would say. Yeah, and and I know we're going to go into it a little bit more deeply, but it's actually what I would describe as a very sneaky, a sneaky form of, uh, I guess, exper- a sneaky experience that's really hard to to define. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And, and I think it's so sneaky because, you know, when you ask someone, well, tell me about your childhood, oftentimes they'll say, you know, hey, I had a great childhood. I have a loving parents. I had a loving home, didn't want for anything. And yet there were these things that failed to happen for someone. And and I think that's the distinction that Dr. Webb makes in our work that is so, so interesting and so compelling. It's what didn't happen for you that really characterizes that. And then, so when you ask someone, well, tell me about your childhood, everything's going to sound great. Everything's going to sound hunky-dory. There's nothing for them to pinpoint. And so that's what makes it so hard. And it, it makes it such a sneaky kind of a, presenting complaints, if you will, this C and that, you know, she's exploring and and that I'm also exploring with my clients. Yeah, because you can't really describe something that didn't happen. So you don't even know that it was, you know, it would have been helpful to be there. Exactly. Exactly. What drew you to, to focus on this area? You know, I think like for anyone, I think the things that we often struggle with personally often inform the things that we become interested in professionally. And so for me, it was certainly trying to find 
answers for myself and for things that I had struggled with. And that's how I came to to CEN. And, you know, I started to notice that the clients that were coming to me were showing up with some similar struggles that I had had when I was younger. And so I realized, gosh, there's something, there's something going on here. I'm attracting these kinds of people who are struggling with these very similar difficulties. So, so yeah, it was certainly a, a very, very much a personal thing for me. And I think too, you know, like with childhood emotional neglect, I think one of the things that is interesting about it is that someone can look very well put together. I mean, they have the trappings of what, you know, society or what they perceive would be, you know, success and achievement. And I think that's also part of what can be misleading or sneaky about this whole thing. Right, right. And so what happens, especially like in with young adults and young professionals that do seem to have it all put together, it's that they'll often keep those cards very close to their hearts. They won't, they won't really share that with anyone because they're very, very much afraid that if anyone realizes who they really are, what they're really about, that they are going to be rejected, that they're going to be disliked, that they're going to be shunned. Um, So they play those cards really, really close to their heart and they don't even verbalize what they're, what they're feeling. If in fact they are aware of what they're feeling. And and many times they're not with CE and Dr. Webb describes uh, them often being alexithymic, which means that they don't understand and they're not uh, aware of emotion. And so I think that's really important for them, for professionals, because in the professional setting, that's actually sometimes applauded and expected, right? Like it's not personal, it's professional. Right. Right, We've often heard that, especially like in corporate workplace settings. And so it's almost like oftentimes people that are high achieving professionals are attracted to these workplace settings that that kind of feed into the alexithymia, if you will. I want to backtrack a little bit and kind of start with some building blocks just so that anyone who's listening, if perhaps they haven't heard of Dr. Webb, read her books, or listened to the other uh, episodes that I mentioned, kind of giving them a foundation for the rest of our conversation. Can you share what is childhood emotional neglect or what we'll be referring to um, as CEN and uh, how does it develop? CEN is, in essence, when a parent is not emotionally attuned to a child to grow while the child is is growing up and and they're missing the ability to be receptive and to respond to the child's emotional needs and so when a parent fails to do those things both of those things both be receptive and respond appropriately or adequately the child learns and internalizes a message about themselves as a result of the lack of response on the part of the parent. And so often it's that message that gets internalized without ever the without the parent ever really saying anything as a result that that starts to affect the child's self-perception and it starts to affect their self-appraisal about who they are and what they're capable of and, and what they can and what they can't do. So it's how the child starts to learn about themselves and the world around them. For CEN it's really what doesn't happen to, for them. So you'll often hear someone say, I had a great childhood, like I said earlier, but when in fact you start digging in that person's personal history, there's a lot of things that fail to happen for them, especially in the parent-child interactions and relationship. How does CEN differ from child abuse? Because I think that that's one of the questions that comes up with people when they're first starting to learn about this? So child abuse is the parent or the caregivers are intentionally neglectful. They're not taking care of the child. They're not feeding the child. They're not clothing the child properly. So the basic needs of a child are not being met. There might be physical abuse. There might be verbal abuse. There might be emotional abuse. In those cases, it's it's often very clear that things are happening to the child and these are aggressive and negative actions. So these, you know, abuse is very much about things that are happening, actively happening and are negative and and very detrimental to, to the child. 
So it can almost be that with child abuse, it's something you can actually identify and see and name it. It's like an outside event that can be observed. Yes. You can see, for example, you can see the the bruises on a child's body, right? You can see uh, a child that's not being fed well or because they're emaciated. You can see the the dirty hair and the dirty clothes when a parent is being neglectful. You can see these things, right? You can even see the distress in someone who's being verbally and emotionally abused by a caregiver. In childhood emotional neglect, we don't see abuse oftentimes. Um, there are instances that, yes, there can be abuse as well as the neglect, but you don't have to have abusive parents to to necessarily have uh, a situation where you've been emotionally neglected by your parents. Oftentimes, even you can have the most well-intentioned and well-meaning parents. And just because they didn't know how to parent any differently, they weren't attuned to their child's needs emotionally. And so unbeknownst to them, they were actually neglecting their child emotionally. What are some of the misconceptions or myths that you see regarding CEN in your work with your clients? You know, for a lot of people, I don't know if it's a myth, but I think certainly we just touched on one of them that that emotional neglect is abuse. You know, it's it's certainly not necessarily always abuse. I would say the other myth is that, you know, oftentimes when you when I start having these conversations with clients, um, and we start to discover in therapy that they are, in fact, children or adults that, as children, were emotionally neglected. You know, for a lot of them, they, they're, the big fear is that because this happened so long ago, that this might not might not be changeable. They, this might not be um, something that they can overcome. That can be further from the truth. It's it's not something that I will always tell my clients. It's not always easy because changing is never easy, but it's certainly possible. So I would say that's probably, those two are probably the two biggest misconceptions that I find in my work with clients that are experiencing the CEN symptoms. Yeah, I've seen, you know, the the one that you just mentioned right now too, about feeling like that this is just how they're going to be. This is the way that I am. And it, it's not something that I am able to really change. But one of the things I, that I find interesting about what I've seen um, in my personal experience and then with clients is that sometimes just even beginning to understand what CEN is, getting that initial insight already creates some some shift or some sense of healing, even if you have if that's all you've done so far. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think when, I don't know if this happens with you and and you've seen this with your clients, I think I find that as soon as we start touching on these topics that are deeply ingrained from childhood, it kind of scares people. It really freaks them out because it feels, it feels to them so, it's so far in the past that they don't think that there's any possibility of changing that. But because it's not in their present, they won't be able to affect any change as a result that they're doomed to be this way forever. Nothing could be further from the truth. I think, like you said, as soon as they start to realize, oh, that's what this is. Oh, this is how it shows up in, in my life. And they can start identifying the ways that it does show up the more empowered they are to then turn around and say, well, I'm going to choose something different. And sometimes they need some coaching and some support around what, you know, what a different response would look like because they really didn't get that. And so, you know, that's the role that we play as therapists in that context is, is to help them to learn a new and effective way of, of being in the world. And I, I'm, I wonder if you see this also in your work, another response along with the freaking out response <laughs> is the almost a sigh of relief that because all this time that they've been struggling with whatever it was presenting as anxiety, relationship issues or whatever, that they felt like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Like what is, I shouldn't be, I should be able to be handling this. There's no reason for me to be struggling. And when they have this information or this insight, 
it helps them to kind of say, okay, that makes sense. Like now I know, now it make, now I understand. And it takes some of that anxiety or that shame around what's wrong with me. Yes. And for the, especially for the people like CEN shows up in a variety of symptoms, for some people, there's this deep seated feeling of that they are fundamentally flawed and that there's something so deeply wrong with them that they can't share with anybody, uh, that nobody, they can't show that to anybody. Otherwise people will see them and, and shun them. And for people that, that experience that very profoundly, yes, they, they do have that, ex- that reaction to discovering, oh my God, there's this is actually a thing. Yeah. That, fundam- <laughs> that fundamental flaw in me is is not what I thought it was. It's really this other thing. So, you know, I think initially when when the resistance to CEN, because there usually is some resistance. Yes, there is. <laughs> there is. When that kind of goes away and, and we move into that next phase, for a lot of them, there is that relief like, oh, okay, I have I have something tangible, something that I can call this. Um, it's not this kind of vague, amorphous feeling of not being okay, not being right in the world. So in that sense, yes, when when they're able to wrap their head around the fact that this is a something, it is incredibly helpful. So what what are some ways that someone can tell if they have been impacted by childhood emotional neglect? And obviously there's a questionnaire that Dr. Webb has put together, but if someone wants to kind of just do an inventory of their their life and their experiences. I would say one of the best ways that they could go about that is to kind of ask themselves, do they suppress their feelings? Do they feel like there's something wrong with them? Do they feel empty inside? And they can't quite put their finger on why they feel empty inside. They look around their life and they've got the things that they want. They've got the success they want. They've got the life they want. And yet it's still not fulfilling. Those are usually some of the the traits of people with CEN, especially high achieving professionals. That's what I tend to see, that they'll just keep achieving and acquiring stuff and even, even experiences, right? They'll go out and have travel. Uh, they'll overspend. You'll often see them over, maybe even overeat. They'll have, because I would say also that's one of the other symptoms is this lack of self-discipline, right? They'll often also come in and say, uh, well, I'm lazy. Despite the fact that they're very high achieving, right? They'll say, well, I'm lazy. I'm a procrastinator. Another one is that they'll come in and say, Oh well, I work on well. I I do my best work under pressure, right? And and they'll leave everything to the last minute, and so then they're in this constant state of anxiety because they've procrastinated everything to the last minute, literally. And so now they're in this pressure cooker situation, and it's due to lack of self discipline, and that is very much firmly rooted in those childhood experiences and how the parents chose to parent or, or, or rather in this case, not parent the, that uh, adult when they were a child. So I would say that, especially in professionals, those are, those are kind of the ways that they shows up often. You also see a very strong tendency towards what Dr. Webb calls counter-dependence, meaning that um, there is this very strong desire to not depend on anyone, to not ask for help, to not be supported by anyone. These are people that oftentimes, that I mean, they will groan and moan if they're put into a group um, or a team in a workplace setting because they don't want to have to depend on anyone to get anything done. They, you know, and, and sometimes they'll even tout the fact that they did it all by themselves. So, so almost like a, a badge of honor, take pride that I don't need anyone. Yeah, yeah, they do. They often do. Outwardly, I would say, but inwardly, they realize that, gosh, this is this is hurting them. But it's 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 hard for them to to finally get to that point where they actually admit it that that this is becoming a damaging quality rather than one to be proud of. You know, something I just was you know came to mind when you were talking, and this is anecdotal. I don't have any research on this, but I'm, I'm sure 
thinking that there's a correlation too between professionals who have this imposter syndrome and childhood emotional neglect. Absolutely. You know, and that and that comes to another symptom of the childhood emotional neglect that Dr. Webb describes, which is this, she calls it self-appraisal. These people have a very kind of disjointed sense of self and self-appraisal. They really can't see themselves clearly, what they're good at, what they're not good at. They they don't have a sense of that. It was never mirrored for them by their parents. And so in the face of not really having a clear sense of self and not being able to perceive yourself clearly, they might actually be very good at something and yet they they think they're terrible at it. And so then that's where that imposter syndrome comes from and they feel like a fraud and they feel like they shouldn't have that particular job or be put in that particular role or given a promotion because they feel unworthy and undeserving of it. I think another piece of this is I've seen this with clients is a re- as they do their this work, this recovery work around CEN is the I guess the disappointing or the heavy realization that goals that they've pursued, lives that they've created were perhaps founded on just what they knew society or people would approve of. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you stop and think of it, you you have somebody who doesn't have a clear sense of themselves or making these choices when they're, you know, relatively young. You know, we send kids off to college at 18 and, and with very little guidance as to how to go, go about picking a major, how to go about picking a career. Like, there's not a lot of guidance at any point in college, really, if you think about it. It's kind of just left up to the person to kind of follow follow their interests, follow their their aptitudes. But if that if someone doesn't have a clear sense of what their aptitude and their talents are, or even what their weaknesses are, then people just kind of gravitate to, I don't want to say what's easiest, but what people will gravitate to what feels familiar to them. So oftentimes, you know, you, you'll see that, you know, they were good at math or they liked reading and okay, they, they go into a math or a STEM field, or if they liked reading, they'll go into arts and into the arts. And, and so, and oftentimes, and that might not be the best choice for them, especially career wise, because they'll come out with a degree, but they won't know what to do with it. They won't know, you know, why they studied that field to begin with. So in that case, we would say that that person's identity has, has been foreclosed as far as the, the career development and what have you. And that's something that often does happen for people with uh, CEN. It, it's that they'll find themselves professionally in that sort of like an identity foreclosure situation. Or they'll do whatever their parents told them to do. Well, you should be a doctor. And so, okay, I'll go be a doctor or I'll, I'll go be a lawyer or an engineer or whatever the case may be to, again, you know, please the parent. Yeah, and, and I work with many clients who we would consider like at midlife or middle age. So I would say a lot of my clients are maybe the youngest would be in their 40s, but a lot in, let's say, 45 to 55. And it's interesting to see the long-term effects of childhood emotional neglect beyond, you know, you know your, your area that you work with, you know, with young professionals and that, you know, they have now established a career, a life. They've created structures that are kind of really rooted. And so it's, I think it's wonderful that you're doing this work and helping to, you know, kind of, I guess, intervene sooner than later. Yeah. You know, I, and, and I agree with you, right? Because when someone is older, unfortunately in our society, it becomes much more difficult for them to make that career change. Whereas this millennial generation is thankfully much more self-aware they still experience the CEN, but they're much more acutely aware that that's, that that being this way is not okay. It's not right. It's not. It just doesn't feel right. There's something missing, and so they're much more likely to seek out support to figure it out. They're much more likely to report feeling bored. They'll start a career post college, and all of a sudden they're like you know, I've mastered this now I'm bored. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do next. And so they'll start kind of 
change jumping around careers or at least jumping around um from from one company to another company and so it's about getting them to realize why they have this boredom why they avoid anything that's tedious anything that's monotonous why if they find it difficult to stomach feedback from bosses and and why they don't like it when they struggle. I, you know, it's one of those things. I don't know if you find it with with your clients, but I find that the, my clients really, really hate <laughs> yeah. it when they hate <laughs> yes, it. Yes, I see that. When they struggle, they hate it when they can't be great at something because they never had to struggle. They were never. They were often never really put in situations where they had to struggle and and try and really exert and be effortful in in an endeavor and that really when they get to the adult world of the working world that's not always the case you know you you have to work hard you have to put forth effort you have to collaborate with colleagues and you and sometimes you even get not so nice feedback from from your supervisors and it's all about learning how to interact with people and being able to take that feedback constructively and for a lot of them they really 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 struggle with it and so i you know i help them figure out like is is this just a symptom this wanting to change careers or this boredom that you're feeling is this a symptom of the CEN or or did you ju- or did you really really truly cho- choose poorly and and if you did choose poorly, then what what steps can we then take to to get you in a career that is fulfilling and satisfying to you? But for a lot of them, it's it's really a symptom of the CEN, and and it's interesting. The boredom often will also show up in their relationships. They'll get bored, and in healthy relationships, they'll get bored, and they'll run away from those relationships. So that lack of self discipline, even in the relationships, when the relationships kind of end the honeymoon phase and it goes into more longer term stability phases, they'll run away from the relationships too. I'm really glad you, you mentioned that. And of course, I know we're not focusing on relationships, but definitely uh, when the relationship is no, no longer has that sense of ease that can happen. Yeah. Or the sense of newness. So what are some first steps that someone can take in recovering from CEN? Well, I would certainly say that if somebody is listening to this or has read Dr. Webb's books, Running on Empty and Running on Empty No More, those are great entry points. She runs a blog too, which I think is also pretty great. I think it's on Psych Central. So those are great entry points, I would say, into CEN if anyone listening is kind of thinking, well, maybe, maybe that sounds like me. Maybe, maybe I have this. So those are great entry points. I think another good entry point is to kind of, you know, if you don't, oftentimes these people don't remember a lot about their childhood. So sitting down with a therapist and, and starting to explore these and start having these conversations about what their childhood was like uh, what they experienced, maybe, you know, obviously what they didn't experience and start to kind of uncover this stuff is, it are, you know, good ways to, to begin this process and this phase of discovery for, for CEN. And I'd also like to add too that on Dr. Webb's website, she has a list of uh, mental health professionals who focus on or are trained in, or one of their niches is childhood emotional neglect. So that's also a good way to connect with a mental health professional who is aware of this and can be a support to you. Yes, that's true. Absolutely. She does. And she keeps it really well updated, I find. So Erica, what are um, some of the, I guess, the roadblocks or barriers or problems that you've seen come up for someone when they're in the process of recovering from CEN? Well, certainly initially a lot of resistance, especially for someone who feels like they had a a pretty good childhood. There's a lot of resistance to what they initially feel is blaming their parents. So certainly that is, is a roadblock. And the next part that I would say is, is another big roadblock is the immense amount of emotional discomfort. You know, these are people that tend to wall themselves off emotionally from the world. And so when in therapy, 
the wall starts coming down, uh, it's like, I mean, it's like this, like a dam that's, you know, you're taking bricks out of the dam and, and water's coming through. And all of a sudden, more and more water and you hit a critical point where the dam breaks and all this emotion comes flooding out. And so that, for someone who's repressed these emotions for so long, is incredibly uncomfortable for them incredibly uncomfortable and teaching them how to emotionally self-regulate is uh, something that it becomes really important in recovery from CEN. Yeah. I've actually seen like a, I I see a pattern in my clients in this process of, Mm -hmm. you know, there's this, the realization, oh, okay, this, this could be CEN. And as that realization crystallizes, I, I can see the almost like panic or the or the sense of being overwhelmed and then i've also noticed you know maybe canceling a session <laughs> yes or, or or not doing their homework which you know which, which yes. might be just pay attention to what you're feeling check in with what's coming up for you i mean and then and when if we can get through that then you you get into to the next phase but definitely i've i've noticed that it's almost predictable and and then oh also like i've seen this too there's so there's this uh awareness and then perhaps the buy-in and then the backpedaling from it a little bit. Like, uh, I don't know if that's what's, what's going on. I don't know if you've seen that. I have seen the backpedaling. I think I get more of the backpedaling than, than the resistance. I think that might be culturally down here in, in Miami. We have such a, such a, it's such a melting pot down here, but it's predominantly Hispanic and in Hispanic families, you know, they venerate the mother, you know, the mother and the father are, you, you you can't talk badly about your parents, you know, that's, you know, it's uh, It's a sacrilege, right? Yeah, it is. It's, it's it's blasphemous. And so, and so to really start having those conversations, you know, socially, culturally, you have, I have to be very careful when, when I'm going in and I'm, and I'm asking people about their mothers because people get very, very, very defensive yeah. about having that conversation or blaming their mother you know, because they're often say, you know, my mother did the best she could. What are you trying to say? This is her fault. And so, you know, it's, it hurts people. Yeah. To, they feel like they're betraying their parents by even having this conversation with, with us mental health professionals. And, you know, I, I like to tell my clients, I don't know what you tell them, but I tell my clients, you know, yeah, this is your parents' fault. They weren't emotionally attuned to you, but it may be that they themselves were parented this way and they just, they didn't know they were passing it along to you first and foremost. And, you know, it's not so much that we're blaming them. It's more like, yes, it's their fault. They may not have, may not have done it on purpose, but now it's your responsibility to address this because now you're aware of it. And so I, I find that when I reframe it for them in that way, that this is not so much about blaming your parents. This is about now your responsibility to yourself to take care of yourself and, and to provide for yourself the things that you need that they perhaps couldn't, wouldn't, weren't aware of, that they weren't providing for you. You know, it, it usually lowers people's defenses. Yeah. Yeah, I see that too, the the guilt around, you know, being critical or blaming of their parents. And the way that I reframe it is I I remind them that, you know, your parent was was is an amazing parent and he or she did do these things. And this is something that was missed for whatever reason. And this just helps you to understand it so you know how to move forward and make changes. But you know, we're not dwelling on you know, what your parents did or didn't do and that they were terrible parents. It's to, it's to understand the process. It doesn't negate any of the wonderful things about them. Yeah. You know, and for anybody that reads the book, uh, Dr. Webb's books, she did, she did describe the different kinds of parents that do tend to be emotionally neglectful of, child, of their children. And I find that that, you know, that's a beautiful reframe yeah. for, a, for a lot of adult children of parents except the last one. The last kind of parent which is the, that she describes which is the sociopathic parent. That one's really really hard because they weren't good parents and and yet they are so manipulative and they create the illusion that they were that that's a very difficult ball of wax to untangle I find. Yeah, and that usually has a 
well, there's a lot more complexity and entanglement with that one. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Dr. Martinez, what is the best way for listeners to learn more about your work? If they would like to work with you, what's the best way for them to find you? Probably the best way for them, for anyone to connect with me is through the website. The website really for me is my hub. It's envisionwellness.co. You know, there's links to all of my social media accounts and there's a way to fill out a contact form to schedule a phone call with me. So, and even read my blog. So that's probably the best way to to stay stay abreast of what I'm up to. And we will put links to everything that you've mentioned in the show notes so that listeners can can find you. Thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with me about this really important and relevant topic. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. It's my pleasure. Take care. Thanks. You too. Thanks so much for listening to the Women in Depth podcast. I hope it brings you a deeper understanding of yourself and others, and that you found some insights that illuminated and inspired. You can follow Women in Depth on Facebook and YouTube, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. And finally, if you enjoy Women in Depth, please share with a friend. Again, thank you so much for listening, and see you next time.